All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the inaugural lecture in the Modern Chinese Humanities Seminar. Uh, my name is Li Jie and I teach Chinese Film and Media Studies at Harvard. Uh, I'm co-organizing this lecture series with my colleague David Wang uh, to feature some new scholarship in Modern Chinese uh, Literary media and cultural studies. Uh, we are very grateful for the sponsorship and logistical support of the Fairbanks Center. Um, special thanks to Mark Grady and Dan Murphy. So uh, Professor Wang will give everyone a preview of some upcoming talks before we introduce our speaker today. Thank you very much, Jian. Um, thanks uh, everyone online uh, together with Professor Lee. I wanted to thank you for joining us for this uh, inaugural lecture to be given by Professor LaFrance Alcudre uh, of NYU. Very briefly, that this is our inaugural talk and we are very honored to have a very distinguished speaker uh, talking about uh, her most recent um, project. But um, uh, in the following weeks, we also have a couple of more uh, events um, which I'd like to introduce um, uh, here just very, very briefly. On October 7th, Professor Lai Kuan Pan of uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong uh, will speak about a very intriguing uh, topic, economic sovereignty um, in contemporary China, the biopolitical subject as a garlic chive, Zhou Cai. Right? And that will take place um, um, uh, in the evening at 8 p.m. October 7th. And then again, on October 28th, um, Professor Xiaoling Ma from um, Yale, NYU um, in Singapore, um, she will talk about the stone and the wireless, the lyrical media and bad models of the feeling uh, women. And um, again, um, this um, event will take place in the evening at 8 p.m. Um, the date is October 28th. Last but not the least, on November 12th, um, the Professor Michelle Hawks um, from the University of Notre Dame will talk about the shifting limits of a reform, literature and the censorship in China since 1979. And this event will take place at noon. So I uh, would like to uh, welcome all of you to join us for all these events throughout the semester. Thank you, Jet. Thank you, David. Um, so today we are really excited to have Professor Lawrence Codell uh, speak to us about her wonderful new book, um, Newborn Socialist Things, Materiality in Laos, China, which is published a month ago with uh, Duke University Press. Uh, professor Codell is an assistant professor of East Asian studies at New York University. Uh, she received her PhD in Chinese from UC Berkeley in, 19, uh, in 20, uh, 2015. Sorry, Before starting at NYU, she was a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Michigan. And I should also add that she received her undergraduate degree at Harvard, uh, concentrating in music and East Asian studies, and also did an MA in regional studies East Asia program. So, so welcome back to Harvard. Uh, virtually. Um, Professor Cadell's work focuses on Chinese socialist and post-socialist cultural production. Um, so her book, A Newborn Socialist Things, examines the material culture of the Cultural Revolution. Um, and as Professor Paul Clark puts it in his endorsement, takes ordinary objects from everyday life to create extraordinary insights into the Mao era and China today. Uh, her research has appeared in comparative, liter uh, comparative Studies of Society and History, Journal of Material Culture, Modern Chinese Literature and Culture, and uh, Journal of Chinese Cinemas, as well as numerous edited volumes. She's currently embarking on a new project on theory and the everyday in late Mao era. So um, before I turn over to her, since we're in a webinar format, uh, please feel free to type in your questions into the Q&A. And, um, and afterwards, we'll be, um, I, I will moderate those questions and ask them out uh, to Professor Kadao after her talk. And uh, if you can give your um, name affiliation, that would be great. Uh, if you prefer to ask the question anonymously, that would be fine as well. So welcome, uh, Laurence. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, just sort of bear with me here as well try to set up my slides. Okay. 
corner. The joys of technology. There we go. I think we're good. Yes. Um, so, hello, everyone, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, my huge thanks to um, Professor Wong, who will always be Professor Wong, um, and Jeff. Uh, for uh, inviting me um, to do this today. Um, as Jim mentioned, this is a little bit of a homecoming, um, at least virtual, uh, virtually speaking. Um, not only, in fact, because of the six years um, I spent at TUDIV um, and CJIS, uh, but also because um, care of Professor Wong, I spent uh, a semester doing dissertation research um, in Harvard DNJ Library, um, and that research formed the basis of um, the work I'll be talking about um, today. So there is a, a certain full circle quality to this. Um, and I'm indebted to uh, both of you um, for having me back um, again to sort of uh, kick off um, the academic year. My thanks also to uh, Mark Grady for setting up the, the admin side of all this. Um, so I want to start with a story, I guess. In the fall of 1974, Shanghai People's Press released um, a new edited volume um, called Storm at the Counter, Gui Tai Feng Guo, which is a really remarkable collection of short stories, um, all of which are uh, attributed to the Shanghai number one department store composition group. So they're supposedly written by um, department store workers themselves. Um, and the collection comprises fictionalized accounts of the retailers' experiences working in the PRC's oldest state-owned department store. Um, and the ardent spirit of service encapsulated in these stories um, is closely tied to the contemporaneous expansion of the store's purview, uh, which it included not only selling goods, but also repairing, replacing, renting, and recycling them. Um, by 1975, Dora Cadres publicly claimed to offer an array of over 180 such services, ranging from advice on removing stains to collecting spent toothpaste tubes. Um, and in each case, the retailers were said to put the masses' convenience, Feng Yen Chun Zhong, um, a fed of the profit motive, thereby distinguishing themselves from capitalist purveyors. And in the mid 1970s, 
this alongside the centralized plan is what supposedly defined China's commercial sector as socialist. So the stories, as I say, are rather remarkable. And my personal favorite um, is called Pairing Socks, Prevoisel, which is um, about uh, a student worker who shows up in the sock department, um, his name is Chapin, just as they're getting a new program off the ground. And so in response to the suggestion from the masses, the sock department does more now than just sell pairs of socks. It also sells um, singles. Um, so should a customer find herself with only one sock, maybe she lost the other one, or it's been worn too much to be darned, um, she can drop off the one good sock and then leave it there and the staff will pair it, will find a match which can then be picked up um, later on and apparently purchased, right? It turns out um, as Xiaofang discovered that this is really labor intensive. Um, and so there's a, a guy named Master Wu who is sort of the sock whisperer um, and always manages to find the perfect match. And they, they sort of make these matches based on color, but also thread count, thickness, length of cuff, pattern, size, so on and so forth. So should the store's own stock not yield a match, they're even called upon to go to the factories to try to find a remnant. Um, and so Xiao Bang realizes how wonderful this is, learns to take it seriously, um, yada, yada, yada. Um, and in so doing, learns about um, the proletarian workers making the socks and of course the clientele that he's serving. Now, all of these um, services my slide will change here. Um, including the sock pairing, were promoted as newborn socialist things, as Shohojuishin Jongshu. And so, what I want to talk about today in discussing my work um, in my recent book is really what does that mean to call something a newborn thing? Uh, what did it mean at the time? How should we understand that? And sort of my own um, method of drawing inspiration from this term and its potential, albeit um, often, if not always sort of unrealized potential, um, but nonetheless, what I see as um, an interesting bid for something new and the inspiration that I've drawn from that both in terms of 
um, an analysis of the material culture of the cultural revolution and um, methodology uh, for dealing with material culture um, writ large. Um, so this is my shameless plug um, slide available now. Purchase your own copy. Um, so um, the term, right? Jinshou is one that uh, still exists um, and we're sort of used to it meaning just sort of a new thing, right? So like a new fad, a new kind of um, emergent social cultural form, but it can really be a flash in the pan, right? And does not necessarily have um, great uh, cultural significance in a long lasting sense or kind of broader ideological weight. So one of the things that I tried to do is examine what the term as a technical term first in the 1950s uh, meant um, and what the consequences of that term in its technical senses were. Um, so this is a 1959 article um, from Guangming Daily by a party theorist, Sun Dingua. Um, and it really encapsulates uh, the basic uh, defining qualities of what makes something a newborn socialist thing. Being new in and of itself is insufficient. Um, instead, Shun sets up ba basically a four part test, right? So they have to struggle Dojong against old things, um, right? So, so there's some kind of contradiction, struggle, battle going on. I'll talk more about that in a second. They have to forge their own new path. So they have to actually be new, um, right? And they have to uh, break new ground, essentially. Um, they have to be in accordance with developmental principles, which is really a matter of saying um, that if something is new, as in it hadn't occurred before, but it has feudal characteristics, then that doesn't qualify as a newborn thing, right? Um, it has to be appropriate to, in this case, the socialist stage of historical development. And then fourth is it can't just be a kind of temporary momentary thing. Um, it has to have a future, a kind of it, right? Uh, a possibility for taking root, essentially. Um, and in combination, what we get then is a 
the formation, the setting up of a basic developmental dialectic, whereby we're saying there's a battle going on between newborn things and old things. And through that struggle, we get progress, historical progress um, in a kind of classic uh, dialectical uh, mode, right? So um, we need that um, duality of the new and the old, um, that struggle, and then ultimately the victory of the newborn thing over the old thing, right? And if we take that um, seriously, it really means that the, the idea of the newborn thing, um, and then more specifically, the newborn socialist thing is really at the heart of the socialist project writ large, right? Because it's fundamentally tied to historical progress and advancement, development towards communism. Uh, beyond that, it also um, reminds us that socialism, to the extent that it is a thing, and I realize there's a debate about this uh, at the moment, uh, which we do not get into, but to the extent that we might pause it, socialism as a thing, it was always understood meant to be um, liminal, right? It's an in-between transitional period of development. Um, and it was a transitional period that was defined, um, defined at least in part by the juxtaposition of these newborn things that herald the communist future in the present and the survival of these sort of retrograde elements from the past, the old things, right? So socialism as a period of transgression, transgression, transition um, is defined uh, in this telling um, by this side-by-side -side, um, setup of the new and the old, the future and the past. Um, and beyond that, a sense of not really knowing um, how to get to the other side. Right, there's no roadmap for a liminal space. So what instead the agenda becomes, the name of the game is to be able to distinguish the old from the new, to be able to recognize newborn things as newborn things and old things as old things, right? Because you, as a right-minded revolutionary, have a job to do. And that is 
to support the development of newborn things, to help them take root, to make the future, the present, through their um, growth and development. And of course, side by side with that, we do a kind of destruction of the old, right? It's a two, um, two-pronged uh, agenda. And so this um, is a, from a 19, 75 People's Daily article that speaks, um, I think, to a number of these um, concerns as I've played them out. So first we get this sort of opening set up where we have a, the notion of a developmental dialectic, right? That the motor of historical development, it's class struggle to be sure, but also the struggle of newborn things over old things. And so they deserve our support, right, in that process. We also get, because you'll have noticed by now, that I've been a little light on examples of newborn things. And here we get some. Right, cadres, workers, soldiers, peasants, students, and merchants taking the May 7th road. Educated youth going up to the mountains, down to the countryside. Collectivized healthcare and bed for doctors, workers, peasants, and soldiers participating in theory groups, and so on. Now, this should alert us to the fact that, um, in a sense, both old and newborn things were, as a rule, remarkably unthing like, right? Not a lot of things in that list. Um, more precisely, and this would be my take. We might say that they tested, stretched, and exceeded the bounds of materiality. So this is where um, I, in a certain sense, um, read into the potentialities of the newborn thing as a historical term and start to draw inspiration um, from it as a mode of analysis um, and intellectual theoretical engagement, which is to say, that I see in them essentially constellations of objects and bodies brought into relation with each other of institutions produced by and through those objects and bodies and of the social formations that they help to construct. In other words, to me, the promise of the newborn thing is the extent to which 
it brings the social and the material together into one conceptual entity. Um, as I said before, historically speaking, that breaks down um, consistently so that we get these sort of, sorts of um, collapse um, of material things into social formations, which is an interesting um, phenomenon and one that I um, do talk about in the book, right? But the, the gambit is that we need something that allows us to take the social and the material without the one collapsing into the other. That's the hope um, at the, I mean, for the historical actors that um, I referred to and also ultimately for, for me. Um, as a scholar to try to get around the problem that um, we have in scholarship about things, that the things themselves inevitably seem to disappear, um, to give way to language and social meaning um, and interpretation at the expense of materiality. So what I try to do is to focus on what I see as the relational underpinnings of the newborn thing, right? As constellations, as a concept that can encompass everything from a people's commune to a tractor, right? Um, and to think relationally and to foreground that um, relationality itself. So that winds up being my own primary focus. Um, more specifically, my focus lies on the prescriptive form of relationality constituted of both the commodity form and the material construction of Chinese socialist culture. That is to say, I see a homologous um, likeness. I realize that's a redundant phrase, uh, but work okay. um, between the structure of the commodity form and um, the ways in which materiality is understood and operative during the late Mount period. Um, I talk about this form of relationality in terms of mediation which I realize is a word that Jia has a lot to say about as well. So we're in good company um, as a sort of keyword. So the way that I use it um, is 
start playing really on its multiple associations in common parlance, right? So mediation as that which media do in a performative sense. Um, indeed, one of the things that sets the Cultural Revolution apart from the earlier years of the Mao era is the increased number of people, especially in the cities, um, for whom mass media were an integral part of daily life, right? Um, but really, ultimately, I'm approaching media and the cultural work of mediation in such materially broad terms that um, really it should be understood as a kind of situationally derived function of materiality as such. So this sense of context-driven functionality um, is grounded in the second notion of mediation as processes of in-betweenness. So in other words, as that which makes particular relations not only possible, uh, but operative in a given situation. Um, and those relations need not be friendly, right? Um, or the processes by which they're enacted smooth. We think of mediating a conflict, right? Involves bridging gaps between two or more parties. So mediation in this sense, uh, while dialogic by definition can also be dialectical insofar as it's processual um, and at least potentially the stuff of opposition um, and contradiction. All of which brings us to the commodity form, believe it or not. Um, because the understanding of mediation that I just um, articulated clearly applies to monetized systems of commodity exchange which are grounded in a process that renders one thing equal to another in terms of something else. Um, and this, of course, is crystallized in the commodity form itself, which as Marx taught us long ago, is at its core relational. Right. The commodity form implies and engenders social relations between individuals as well as material relations between things. Right. That the former is regularly effaced by the latter. It's famously Marx's explanation for commodity fetishism. But what's sort of interesting to me here is the way that the relational nature of the commodity form makes it particularly promiscuous. Um, it's the kind of mediation that implementizes and facilitates is difficult to limit 
to the realm of actual exchange or to quantify with standard tools of economics. Mediation crosses boundaries by virtue of its very structure. And so in order to get the full measure of the commodity form, we must do so as well. Um, so if this discussion of mediation and the commodity form smacks of um, a historical or universalist abstract abstraction, um, I guess it, there are two things that I would say to that. Um, so the first is uh, my sort of newborn socialist thing gambit, I guess, is to um, ground um, these questions of mediation in culturally and historically specific articulations um, of a particular kind of relationality in the Cultural Revolution. So that remarking on the promiscuity of the commodity form is a condition of possibility for my work, not its end point, right? But doing that um, is nonetheless um, a kind of historiographic high stakes endeavor, just because of what we have come to think we know um, about this period, right? Um, and so that the first thing I would say um, is that we, or I at least, am um, very much focused on um, culturally and historically specific material articulations of this relationality. Um, the second thing that I would say is that the commodity, the notion of the commodity and specifically the commodity form ally Marx is in circulation um, during the period that I'm talking about. So when I refer to throughout the book, commodities, champion, I am using it as a historical term. Um, and so when I get pushback saying, oh, what are you talking about? The logic of the commodity form for, there are no commodities in China before 1978. Um, this is the part where we go. No, um, right, that's just not true um, on the one hand. And on the other, there is a huge amount of consternation throughout the Mao period about the continued existence of commodities. Um, the fact that they're still there is something worthy of 
discussion. Um, and so um, in my work, I draw on that and invoke the notion of the commodity as a historically and culturally specific term to that end. Um, and so what that means then as I'm drawing to a close, I promise, um, is, um, well, ultimately it should, I think, reorient us to rethink what we think we know about Chinese socialism, commodities, um, and the way they continue to inform and resonate through the interactions of media, people, and things. So at a time when commodities were regarded with suspicion as threats to the socialist enterprise, how and to what extent did the workings of the highly saturated cultural revolution media environment nonetheless activate and engage the unsettling potential of the commodity form? How did the constituent parts of this increasingly omnipresent media environment, LPs, radio broadcasts, films, lantern slides, newspapers, magazines, comic books, posters, paper cuts, porcelain figurines, wallets, product packaging, ornamented mirrors, household appliances, and human bodies, just to name a few themselves participate in that process? And to what extent do they bear the imprint of that participation? And finally, how might that impact the way we understand these media objects and their role in the construction of Chinese socialism? then and now? Those are sort of the questions that I lay out at the beginning of my book. I don't think I answer them all, but that's sort of the setup. Um, six chapters where I talk about sound, and space, um, department stores, um, and retail, customer service, um, display, so uh, department store windows, and porcelain figurines, um, political economic theory and textbooks, um, amateur performance uh, and mirrors are the kind of central topics that I explore through this framework, such as it is that I've um, elucidated here in an effort to answer those questions. So with that, I will and here, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think as, as questions or Q and A's are coming in, um, if I may take the privilege of uh, being a panelist who actually there, I, I've been reading your book with great fascination and, uh, and your talk has so far focused mostly on the theoretical interventions, which really 
uh, are helping me rethink materiality, commodity, and all these really important keywords um, in the in the Mao era. Uh, and I actually encourage everyone to uh, to read the specific chapters too, because there's so much interesting. I was particularly fascinated by the sonic technologies of radio and uh, um, the record industry in the in the in the first chapter, but also itinerant vendors and department stores, porcelain figurines. Uh, also a, a fascinating chapter at the end on, on mirrors. Um, I, I was wondering if I could ask you a question about your cover, the, the cover of your book, because I um, think it, it, it really highlights materiality in a way, but the, maybe the materiality that we don't see, but I, I don't know if you could comment a little bit on it, maybe in relationship to something else, because um, one thing um, you mentioned toward the end of your talk is that your book focuses also on the materiality of the media environment um, in, in the cultural revolution, and a lot of the chapters do deal with this. Um, so do you also see your work as engaging with more recent, like a more material or infrastructure turns in media studies. Um, I, I was quite curious also because I, I happen to be reading this book by your colleague, um, Undersea Network, um, uh, and also has cables on the, right. or wires on the cover. Um, and and I, I was wondering to what extent, you know, materiality of media objects themselves is important to your work or how, how do you see your relationship to this, um, body of new scholarship outside yeah. of China studies. I guess Ed Tim all over the place. Ed's is consistent with everything else that I've talked about today. Um, so the cover, um, I didn't want um, anything with Mao on it. That that was my um, my one sort of thing that I said to them. I said I I I, I prefer to stay away from a, a kind of red orientalist mode if we could. Mm -hmm. um, and so instead, we started looking at um, Chinese contemporary artists um, and this was to presented to me as an option and if you look at the objects they're they're not particularly quote unquote Chinese in this kind of big ball of twine um, which I, I really like actually because um because i think i do um aspire to speak to people outside of chinese studies um and so that kind of um unsiloed aspect to it was really appealing to me. Plus, I think there's there, there's something about the whole um, approach to materiality that I try to articulate that makes it sort of flicker in and out, if that makes sense. I'm, I'm really concerned with as I said before, um, not losing materiality behind um, social relations or meanings or um, language. So I try and set to sort of go back and forth between object readings and sort of all this other stuff. Um, and so there's something that I really liked about just like a big mess, you know, of just stuff um, that really appeals to me. Um, yeah, I, I think 
it, you know, thing theory was sort of um, a, a, an important vector for me that informed me. Um, so Elaine Friedgood, who's here at NYU, has done uh, work on materiality and like uh, Victorian novels. Um, and so that was uh, formative in terms of trying to articulate the problem of language and things for me. Um, yeah, I, I, that's not really an answer to your question, uh, but I'm, I'm familiar, I'd say myself with some of these other um, fields. I think the case of China really adds something very different as well. And, uh, and I, uh, yeah, so I look forward to how seeing how your book engages with that. I, I see there are some questions actually coming into the Q&A. Should we uh, yeah, maybe sure. uh, take some of that? So the first question comes from Yi Tiao Guo from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Thank you so very much, Professor Kodel, for your excellent presentation. If I understand it correctly, the project of newborn socialist things was primarily initiated and led by the party or other institutions. So I wonder if the mass created their own newborn things or refashioned their bodies into something different from the officially designated models as a revered uh, or counter mediation in the Cultural Revolution? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think I would say if you look at the kind of the Red Guard Shaoba, um, they're full of um, examples of sort of touting particular practices that they've sort of come up with as newborn socialist things um, and declaring um, sort of victory over the, you know, Sijio that they're um, destroying. Um, so I think there's a way that the, the term as a kind of status afforded certain behaviors um, and social formations um, circulates beyond the party's immediate control, um, which is sort of typical of these things um, because it's really about sort of, um, it, it's really about laying claim to the future ultimately, right? Because to, to call something a newborn thing is to say that it heralds utopia. Um, so it, it winds up being sort of a, a point of contestation, what counts as sort of the future in the present. Yeah, thank you. Actually, as, as you were giving your presentation and emphasizing this term, which I also came across so much in my own research of like these newborns, uh, and I never really thought much about this term until you talked about it. And I, I also wondered about if it's, it's a biological or even ecological implications because it's it's sheng, right? It's sort of giving rise to life. And uh, yeah. so I, I thought it was quite interesting in terms of the, this question, it's not just the party dictating what these newborn socialist things are, but also the, it's meant to grow, um, um, you know, the, the, the phenomena or the, these um, relations that you talk about are supposed to be growing as well. Right, and I think the, the sort of, the, the call to juju, right, to support is really about promoting growth 
right? As opposed to like letting them sort of die on the vine, right? Absolutely, yeah. So the next question is uh, from uh, Misha Hawks, who will actually be giving a talk in our series on November 12th. Um, so um, the question is, uh, your book focuses on the uh, Cultural Revolution period. Would you approach work for the entirety of the Mao period or would it work less well when studying the 17 years before 1966? No, I think it works. I, I, I have this whole very long-winded part in my intro um, that's sort of me wringing my hands about the periodization question. Um, I, the, I, I think it works all the way back to the Great Leap um, because that's when you get the the first major sort of burst in the discourse um, about Xin Chongshu. And, you know, Utopia is supposedly right around the corner. So it, there's a, a sense of sort of imminence um, that plays into this as well. And then it sort of dies down and then it comes back during the Cultural Revolution. So I don't think it's CR specific. And in fact, I think the, the methodology to the extent that I have one um, is hopefully something that um, is um, of interest to just people broadly um, who can sort of look closer to home for inspiration along similar lines. Actually, along those lines, we have a question from uh, Tim Deng, who is a doctoral student at Harvard. Um, thank you very much for the talk and for the wonderful book, which I'm enjoying reading. In the introduction, you mentioned you tried to conduct a thought experiment that understands post-socialist China as actual extension of the previous socialist era and that capitalism with Chinese characteristics should better be reconceptualized as socialism with uh, Chinese characteristics. Uh, can you say more about this point? Although the book is about Maoist China, it seems that you're constructing a new historical model here that can potentially change our view of contemporary China. Thank you. Well, that's the hope. Um, in the sense that, uh, it's still technically socialism with Chinese characteristics, right? I mean, everybody sort of agrees that that doesn't mean much, right? And we've sort of collectively tongue in cheek said, oh, it's capitalism with Chinese characteristics. But that, what, what if we sort of pulled our noses and actually take that claim um, with a certain level of seriousness, um, then that would actually require us to rethink all of our definitions of socialism, right? And it may be that it would in fact explode the term for all intents and purposes. Um, but that, that struck me as an interesting thought experiment and funny because I think a lot of the tensions between sort of, well, um, promoting commodity consumption 
in the name of development, right? Technically, still a communist party, but this is a little detour. Um, market economy is a detour on the way to communist utopia. It just seems really freaking far away, right? Further away than it used to be. But the claimants were the same, right? And the tensions are the same in a sense. Um, and that just seemed like an important thing for us to, to think about and acknowledge, um, if only as a way to, to, to shift the way that we look at the Mao period as also um, imbued with these tensions that we've sort of cynically gotten used to brushing aside um, after 92, right? It definitely um, in the late aughts and teens, if that makes sense. I forgot to mute unmute myself. So um, the next question um, from Tom Gold, uh, do you discuss kitsch? A lot of the things from this period, including things displayed in your office, border on kitsch in my view. Thank you for noticing. Um, do I have thoughts on kitsch? I have any thoughts on kitsch. Um, my initial dissertation proposal was on Kitsch. Uh, but then I realized I had no real methodological entry point into Kitsch. So I sort of dropped it. Um, yeah, no, I think you're right. There's, um, it's sort of right there tempting me are calling out to us. Um, and uh, there's so many comparisons to be made to sort of close communist, close socialist um, nostalgia um, and um, Ostagi in um, Germany um, and all of these sort of associated consumptive practices um, that many um, eminent scholars have talked about in these other contexts. Um, my problem is, well, problem. I think it's a wonderful project for somebody else to do. Um, just because I think it's so much about um, consumptive attitude, right? Um, it's like the hipster in Brooklyn consuming something, ironically, right? It's so contingent on um, individual consumers attitudes and behaviors. Um, and so what's really required is um, ethnography. So what's really required is what Jia does um, and not what I do. <laughs> You know, I, I feel like this uh, book, uh, and for anyone writing a book about kitsch in, in China, you, uh, your book becomes required reading. And um, oh. I um, <laughs> actually, a number of really interesting questions coming up. So um, from Corey Burns at uh, Northwestern University. Hi, Lawrence. Thank you for your talk and congratulations on the book. Can't wait to read it. I really appreciate your relational approach to objects, commodities. At the same time, I wonder about how specific objects or categories of objects might have escaped 
a dialectical or relational understanding. I'm thinking about objects that might have special kinds of auras by virtue of their rarity, newness, or association with power. Objects, in other words, that exceeded their materiality. So the obvious examples are maybe too obvious and we don't have to talk about Mao, but it's easy to imagine commodities signifying differently in different places. For example, a newborn socialist thing born, uh, sold in a Shanghai department store might have felt, looked, or signified very differently for rural rather than urban subject. Yes. Also, hi, Corey. Go Bears. Um, uh, golden Bears. Cow. Never mind. Oh. Uh, yeah, no, I think all that is... Uh, well taken. Um, and I do try to leave room for that um, in the sense that um, I um, can't, I am keenly aware that I cannot um, to recreate the full pantheon of relations, right? Um, historical relations. So what I'm trying to do is to focus on sort of dominant operative structures um, and constellations in a way that nonetheless allows room for all of the kinds of things um, that you just articulated, plus the kind of family sort of affective attachments, you know, that Jeff had written about. Right, like the, those kinds of um, one to one uh, relations, which I, as a pseudo cultural historian, have no access to. Right, so, um, so what that leaves me with. Is trying to write in a way that allows for the kind of polyscenic openness um, of, of these material objects as they circulate. At the same time that we say, okay, well, that doesn't mean that all possibilities are equally probable, right? So, so we can still say something, um, but that doesn't mean that it's the sort of be all end all, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I think the next question kind of also is along um, also methodological lines from uh, Soli. Um, could you tell us more about uh, your research process? What were some of interesting encounters with primary materials in your research experience? Are the plates behind you from those newborn socialist things? <laughs> Um, and uh, another connected question, any connection you found between your research and 1920s uh, Soviet Union? I'm reminded of the avant-gardist construct uh, constructivists uh, production of advertisements, wrappings of commodities like cigarettes and pacifiers, theater, et cetera, um, in Christina Kier's yeah. work. Yeah, the, that book is... Um what's incredibly important um, and inspirational. Um, imagine no possessions um, by Christina Kerr. Um, yeah, I, uh, the, the plates come from a flea market in Chengdu, I think. 
Um, but they're they're fake. Just FYI. <laughs> they're, I wish they weren't, but they're just fake enamel replicas. Um, I I just I, I was shocked that anyone would give me money to go to China and buy things at flea markets, but they did. Um, so I went. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's a lot of um, strange um, objects out there, things that I um, did not expect. Um, really, there's, there's a, a porcelain figurine that's outside this shot that's um, well and truly terrible. Um, but I bought it in a different chair. Um, that's it's a um, what's it called? Shang Zhang Ju Ye Um, and it's two minority students, and the hands are just like twice as big as the head. Um, it's really it's very very bad. Um, and so you get to a point where the worse something is artistically speaking, the more likely it's real um, because that, that's sort of the, the, um, the rule of thumb um, because supposedly uh, amateurs were the ones uh, making this stuff. Um, but uh, I don't know, do I have any funny stories? Not really, I mean, that I, I ate in a restaurant and there was, you know, like a little canteen and there was a poster on the wall and that changed my entire um, research trajectory um, because I had never seen it before and it brought together um, porcelain in a display um, array. Um, and so if I had had my noodles in the other stall across the street, I may not have written this book. Um, you know, things like that. Um, I don't know, now I'm sort of blathering away. But I, I do think one of the things that um, became clear is that there's not a lot of expertise in this particular area um, in so classically classic institutions um, in like the West. Um, so because these objects aren't collected for major museums, again, outside China, Jack can tell us all about museum practices or like thereof um, in the PRC, but the kind of curatorial apparatuses that we as scholars um, draw on um, just to learn basic information about objects, um, how many were produced, when, um, what were the different production lines. Um, it, it's hard to find. So people who have done that work, um, you sort of have to go on the ground. That the people who are doing 
the appraising um, and buying and selling because they have to figure out how much something is worth. And that means knowing how many there are out there of something. It means being able to figure out something is real or fake. Um, and that kind of connoisseurship is something that you have to kind of get in the, the collecting sort of networks and communities um, in, in the PRC that was the only way that I can sort of get into that realm. Um, do, do you want to address the, uh, the Soviet Union comparison as well? Or? Oh, um, sorry, yeah. Uh, it works and it doesn't. Um, it, it, to my knowledge, there's no real comparable sort of constructivist style push to um, come up with a, a new aesthetics of the socialist commodity. But um, the point that I try to make in my book is that the kinds of tensions that Christina Kerr talks about um, read the, the question of how can the revolution coexist with the commodity, um, that tension, it's sort of the tension. It's not just a constructivist um, question, right? I mean, for the constructivists, they're trying to kind of massage that contradiction through aesthetics. Um, but um, other people are trying to deal with it um, in different ways. So the political economists, for example, have to try to figure out how to justify, um, how to explain the persistence of commodities, which they call commodities, um, after um, the means of production are no longer in private hands, right? Like that's a doozy. Um, and so that underlying kind of central tension that care Points to is I think key um, to everything really. Okay, I think we we have we uh, we're trying to get to the last two really fascinating questions. So I'm gonna uh, read both of them and then try to um, we will probably end after these. Um, so um, Alex Alton, my colleague, asked, uh, "Thank you for a fabulously interesting talk. Uh, you already." touched upon it, but can you say a bit more about the temporal model? So, uh, the emphasis on the newborn newness opens up and also forecloses. Uh, newness might work easily well with modern ideas of linear time of progress, Marxist ideas of historical stages, but might also unsettle these. So it seems like newness could be quite malleable and lead into different temporalities, depending on who makes the old uh, slash new distinction and why. And last question from uh, William Schaefer. Congratulations on the book, uh, taking a page from uh, uh, Tim Ingold. I'm, uh, I'm wondering if uh, how materials are at work in the idea of materiality. Uh, aspects of Maoism seem invested in resisting or overcoming the perceived limits of materials. Um, for example, forging steel in the Great Leap Forward, increasing productivity of soil, and the limits of human labor, et cetera. And yet materials also have their own agencies. They can be hard to shape or they break or simply don't work. And the steel forged in the Great Leap Forward is worthless. 
so in the struggle against old things in the Cultural Revolution, is there a sense or even worry that materials can resist that struggle or even might threaten to blur the distinction between old and new things, which are ultimately made of the same materials? What roles do materials play in, our, in your historically contextualized idea of materiality and things? It's a really good question. Um, I'm gonna have to chew on that for a second. Um, for Alex's question, yeah, um, it, it, that's part of the, the, the trickiness of it all, right? Who decides what counts as new and, and further, um, what is new today can be old tomorrow. Indeed, it will be if we're doing our jobs, right? Because um, we will progress um, and move forward. And therefore that which pointed the way forward will become out of date. Um, so there is that. There is also in the cultural revolution, in particular, the very kind of uh, acute threat, at least it was felt to be acute, of um, going backwards, right? So it turns out it's not inevitable that we will go in the right direction, right? We could be taken down the capitalist road um, and go the wrong way. So then it becomes that much more important to get a good sense of these signposts ultimately, right? These kinds of metrics measures of progress um, and directionality are you going the right way and who decides. Um, and yeah, a kind of best, best before date to these um, newborn things for sure. Um, William, excellent question. I guess I would say the closest I come is in my discussion of porcelain um, because there I think there is really um, a wrestling with the meaning of a material. Um, and a kind of effort to proletarianize porcelain through um, a change in its uh, production through the creation of these big semi-mechanized uh, factories and assembly lines that somehow make it turn more acceptable as a material. I also talk about bodies as material or molding um, in a way that uses porcelain as a metaphor. So in that sense, I talk about um, materials. Um, and the materiality of materials. But I, I think you're right. I mean, the, the, the question of sort of stuff not acting the way you want it to is like totally part of the story here, right? That like things have properties and they act and impact their environments um, 
And so dealing with that um, is part of the story. Um, even when, in some cases, you're talking about sort of necessary evils, right? Things that would be easier to just get rid of, but instead you have to sort of recast them in some revolutionarily appropriate way. So yes, I take your point. Okay, thank you so much, Lawrence, for a wonderful talk and for a wonderful book. Uh, not to commodify your book, but I, I think everyone oh, should read please, it. Please. <laughs> yeah, please, but please, I... Please. Uh, yeah, and, and also thank you everyone for staying to the end. And I hope to see some of you at our the next talk uh, by uh, Professor Lai Quan Tan on the biopolitical subject as garlic chai. This is um, uh, October 7th at 8 p.m. So thank you and bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.